Can, can I have my image? Just look at that picture. What do you see in that picture? Anybody can... What? Tiffany box. How come that you know this? Huh? So isn't that amazing? So what, what I'm talking about today is culture inside, the culture that directs things. Um, products and services, they provide a function, but the culture shapes a brand, but both go together. I show you a, a piece of work I was involved with uh, during my time uh, in advertising as a chief creative officer of Leo Burnett and think about what the function is of the product and think about what the culture is. Can we have sound? Sound, please. Hmm? The what? No, it's... New boots are like friends. They get better with age. So the function of the product is to provide flavor in a cigarette for a man. That was the positioning. The culture is that this was defined within Marlboro country means the West, the leadership, the, the, the educated man in the lead. That was the culture coming uh, uh, through this campaign. Now on the left side, you see a photograph that I've taken from a picture uh, that always was on my desk. Now, uh, to auction that, what would you pay to get this uh, photograph that I send you the photograph to your computer? What would you pay? Anybody would pay a dollar or ten dollars or five dollars? Who pays more? What? Five euro. Who pays more? Ten euro? Okay, you, uh, you ten. A anybody more? Okay, you all will get it uh, um, uh, at a certain price. Uh, thanks for bidding. Now the picture on the right, um, what would you pay for the picture on the right? It, it's also a photograph taken from a photograph. Five thousand? Yeah, you're kind of good. Huh? You, you know about this business. Well, you will not get it for five thousand. You might get it for two hundred and fifty thousand, yeah? because it was taken by Richard Prince of the Marlboro campaign. So uh, you three, you will get that. But it shows you what kind of culture has been produced on that brand and in the most valuable um, uh, brands in the world, you see Marlboro still at number five while Apple is at number one. Now, this is what I'm talking about uh, in the next 20 minutes. A product or a service provides a function. Culture shapes a brand. In shaping, building, and growing a brand's culture of creativity, values, clarity, authenticity, origin, heritage, and differentiation, as well as inventing and innovating its gestalt and voice, think local before global, dig into genius lotzi, the spirit and the experience of the place, dig inside people's lives, wants, needs, dig into customer behavior, dig into markets, dig 
for inherent drama, dig for the truth, make culture your strategy, discover it, create it, recreate it, adopt it, apply or merge it, rediscover it for the sake of creating value. Now, I will pick some of those in this presentation. It's actually a longer presentation, but I give you a glimpse of, of that piece of work. So, uh, the first thought, culture evolves from the spirit of the place. I mean, you kind of have seen it with Marlboro, but uh, uh, the most cultured, uh, one of the most cultured filmmakers, Wim Wenders, that, that I know, he has a special way of working. He cannot develop a story and go to Hollywood and sell the story, and then Hollywood might throw uh, some technology on it in order to make it fit for the world. He has to dig into a place. Now, listen to what he has to say about uh, uh, one of his movies. So I was walking around Berlin, trying to find an angle of how to make a film in Berlin that was also dealing with Berlin and thought of maybe children as leading actors, protagonists. I was walking around every day and made lots of notes. And I was looking for the story and I wanted the city to suggest the story somehow. And on my walks I realized there were lots of angel figures everywhere in the city of Berlin, on houses, in old cemeteries, in most unexpected places Berlin when you really pay attention, is full of stone, wooden, marble angels. So on one of my notebooks I found a note, angels, question mark, guardian angels, as leading characters, and I didn't take that very seriously. I didn't erase it though like I would erase other ideas. It survived on the notepad. The idea came not only because of my walk through the cities and the reoccurring motif of angels in the city, it came also because I was reading almost every night Wilke. And of course all his poems are inhabited by lots of angels. Every second or third has an angel figure in them. Also because I'm a very old fan of Paul Clay's and I had on my working desk a drawing of his, of an angel. So somehow, in my work at the time, the angels were present. So when finally I decided to take that little note, guardian angels as leading characters, question mark, seriously, I thought about it for a while, and then I called Peter Handke, who I was going to call anyway, to ask him if he could help me on the movie. And I told him I don't have much of a story, Actually, I don't have any story. I'm going to make a movie here in Berlin rather spontaneously. And Peter immediately said, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to write the script. It's the last thing I want to do in my life right now is write a script. I said, hold on, hold on. Let me first tell you what I want to do. And I told him this very first rough story on the phone of an angel roaming the city. Maybe there were several angels. You would fall in love and then become a human being. And I asked him, do you think it's foolish? And Peter said, no, 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 that sounds interesting. Maybe you come by and visit me. So Peter Hanke then wrote 12 dialogues, which became uh, pretty famous. The whole film became very famous. And you see the principal digging into a place. I mean, uh, Wim Wenders spent one year in searching for material for the, the movie he wants to make. And that's the way he works. I mean, like Buena Vista Social Club, he was with Ray Kuda in, in, in um, Havana and ran into this story and then suddenly he had a movie which became so famous. Or Paris, Texas, he was interested uh, in the phrase in the, in, the, in, in, in the U.S. in the middle of nowhere. So they tried to figure out where is the middle of, of nowhere, he and Sam Shepard and then went along and created Paris, Texas, Texas which, which took them almost uh, a year also to film the pieces. When I was appointed to chief Gro uh, creative officer at Leo Burnett in Chicago, coming out of Germany, 
The first thing I did in 1986 to turn around live its thought, think global, act local, into think local, manage global. Because that was a concept that has heart and that has reality and that engages the people around the world for, for creating rather than, you know, uh, being at the mercy of a centralistic thinking. With that uh, strategy, it was possible uh, to have uh, 27 agencies within five years that were appointed agency of the year in a local market. And you get that for performance, you get that for the quality, which becomes a discussion. And now, i give you two examples, uh, one from Oslo and one from Malaysia where we began to uh, make locally cultured communication and uh, the film you see from Oslo, it's, it's almost what we did without any knowledge, just had like on stage a camera and acted in front of the camera and it became a kind of cult way of doing things. The Malaysian things has a lot of warmth because the society in Malaysia was very violent and uh, we thought, uh, tried to have a very human approach for our clients. Just look at this. That was at the heart of the craziness of uh, Scandinavian advertising, actually. My name is Omi. Omi Kazrina. I like her. Uh, why do you like her? She wears earrings, she ties her ponytail. Um, she's pretty. Uh, what? Do you wish you could say to her? Do you want to come on a date uh, to a romantic dinner? And um, does she know you like her? No, I keep it a secret. Why? I don't want the whole world to know. Why not? Because everybody will laugh at me. What, why should they laugh at you? Huh? Why should they laugh at you? She doesn't like me. She doesn't like you? My name is Omi Gazelina. Who's your best friend? Tan Hong Mei. Tan Hong Mei? Do you like him? Do you have a boyfriend? Who's your boyfriend? Tan Hong Mei. So, uh, in order to create culture, we have to have culture in the first place. I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. Uh, TBWA, for instance, they've defined their culture with disruption. Uh, I don't have the time to explain what's behind it. Uh, Sachin Sachi, love marks that it's easier to understand. Crispin Porter, Boguski, baked in, or irreverence from Bartle Bogle Hegarty. Now I show you a couple uh, of um, uh, deeds behind irreverence and behind fame from uh, Bartle Bogle Hegarty. The first one is this one.
Now this was the first piece of 27 years communication created by Bartle Bogle Hegarty under the idea of irreverence, provocation to society and so forth, Marlon Brando, James Dean type stuff. Uh, and in Europe, Levi's actually could charge the double amount uh, uh, versus the United States for, for their jeans. Now, look at this one. That was the first commercial they did after they won the pitch. Every year, the Schmitz, the Mullers, and the Reinhardts drive to their holiday villas. The Schmitz car is slow and rather noisy. So when they arrive, they'll need another holiday to get over this one. The Mullers drive a big, thirsty car, which is probably at a petrol station somewhere between Munich and Marbella. The Reinhardts drive an Audi 100, a car so aerodynamic that it's capable of 125 miles per hour. Yet, at a steady 56, it slips along quietly for over 750 miles on one tank full of petrol. And the moral of the story is, if you want to get on the beach before the Germans, you better buy an Audi 100. Vorsprung durch Technik, as they say in Germany. So that, that was the way they won the pitch through Vorsprung durch Technik. And Vorsprung durch Technik, they discovered somewhere at uh, a visit at the factory in Ingolstadt and uh, asked what does it mean, they understood, but at the time the function of the car with the four-wheel drive and with uh, uh, the aluminium uh, body, that was a given, but the car itself had a lousy image in Germany. Uh, so five years later they created the TT, this Vorsprung durch Technik now became the culture and you know what, what happened to Audi, especially uh, uh, those folks uh, from, from Germany here, sensational. But here a thought, a line, suddenly changes uh, the values of a company in a very dramatic way. So uh, culture and counterculture, for instance, anybody knows the guy on the left side? What? It's Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc bought the first three McDonald's in California and uh, made something out of it. Yeah? On the right side, it's Carlo Petrini, uh, an Italian who saw how McDonald's in 1986 built uh, um, uh, the service in the middle of Rome and was embarrassed. But you know, not to be embarrassed about it. He started slow food, the slow food uh, uh, movement. And slow food today, over 120,000 uh, uh, restaurants around the world uh, work after the concept of slow food. And out of slow food, a lot of new concepts are also in development. On the left side, you see a shopping picture from uh, last November, and that was taken on Black Friday. You know what Black Friday is? Yeah? Black Friday. The picture on the right uh, was shot uh, because of a creation of uh, uh, American Express. American Express wanted to support small business, so they invented Small Business Saturday. And with some companies, they put that on the ground, and that will be a new culture to shop small business on Saturday. And they got Obama. They got over a billion transactions yeah, just on that day. So culture to cult, quickly. I mean, what do have all those beautiful people in common? And you see it very quickly. Uh, Hawaiianas. Uh, so that is a cult brand developed out of uh, 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 Brazil. Before they, they had the idea to, to shape, uh, to give it that cultural shape, when you left uh, Havaianas at the beach, you know, it was there the next morning, but today it's gone in five minutes, especially in Brazil. Uh, 
Freitag bags, I don't know if, if, if you know that, but the culture is recycling. So when they built their shopping tower in, in, in um, uh, Zurich, they bought 18 rusted containers out of Hamburg and assembled them, and inside it looks like a boutique in Rapongi, and outside you see how that is. So creating on the crossroads of culture, which is also very interesting. And this is a profile of one person who had the hippie culture, rebel culture, counterculture, design culture, technology culture, zen culture, culture of implementation, culture of innovation, Bauhaus culture, animation culture, movie culture, music culture, and culture of entertainment, so to speak. And on the crossroads of these cultures, the guy developed his company and the products. Anybody knows that guy? Correct. That's him. So uh, just uh, give, you, give you a bit of, of a glimpse what, what came out of Bauhaus culture because he had the link to Hartmut Esslinger, Hartmut Esslinger, to Dieter Rams, Dieter Rams, Ulmer School. Ulmer School was established by Max Bill uh, from Switzerland. He was a student of Bauhaus, and Bauhaus, uh, uh, one most important thing of Bauhaus is handling, easier handling. And you see Dieter Rams and Jonathan Eve, uh, how uh, similar those products are in shape, not necessarily from the inside. So one more little thing. There's one more feature I want to show you, and it's actually a system-wide feature having to do with the keyboard. When we released the original iPhone, we revolutionized the way people would type on multi-touch displays. And we keep on challenging ourselves to make that even better. Well, we have a new variant of the keyboard in iOS 5 for the iPad, which we think people who like to type with their thumbs while holding it are really going to like. In the bottom right, you see the keyboard button, and now it has some grab handles. If I just take those and drag it up, it splits it into two. So you know that if you have the iPad. But the main thing is the product culture, the phenomenal product culture that uh, these people have. Uh, which actually clashed him with uh, Jim Scully, who had a typical marketing culture. And, and he was ousted uh, at uh, uh, Apple. So here is finally... Here's to the crazy ones. With his voice. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs. And those and the are the holes. people he really admired. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So they crafted around uh, the function a phenomenal cultural company and, uh, you know, uh, being the number one in this uh, world is uh, very well deserved. So my last question is, what is my culture, my personal culture? Very hard to define uh, what is the culture of my brand, what is the culture of my company. And once you can boil it down to a couple of words or so, I think you can audit very well what you're doing. And uh, it would be very nice if you look from time to time what we're doing at the Berlin School where we help great creatives to become great creative leaders. And uh, as I said at the beginning, if you want to uh, um, uh, download the app, bigrideapp.com, um, that would be nice. Thank you very much. It's now Kevin. 
If there are any questions, I mean, maybe we... Do, do you have any questions? All set. Kevin, stage is yours. Hello, hello. Do I need to test to see if it's on? Hello, everyone. Just want to make sure that's ready. Is that? Uh... Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to speak a little bit today about uh, the citizen as art with respect to my own experience uh, in leveraging culture in, uh, in a public uh, exhibition, con uh, you know, in, pu in, the, in public spaces. Um, uh, ex ex exhibiting art in public spaces, uh, you, you uh, find that sometimes difficulties arise. Uh, one today that you'll, you'll encounter in a bit is my, uh, my images will appear about 10% uh, stretched. Uh, it just has a technical glitch, I suppose. Uh, I just have to uh, uh, let, let you uh, inform you because uh, everyone will seem a little bit fat. I'm showing a lot of portraits. Um, <clears throat> I have a problem. It, uh, it involves uh, uh, when I travel, I, I tend to uh, uh, start new projects. Um, this, this can be uh, engaging the, the local citizenry of a, of a locale uh, to, to serve as my uh, subjects for portraiture, um, usually a series representing the community, a village, a city, a nation. Uh, I've offhandedly referred to myself as a, uh, an anthropologist trapped in the body of a visual artist. But this is not uh, entirely true because my scientific interest in my subjects, uh, it, you know, pales in comparison to sort of my ontological aspirations, which is to say that I'm more interested in the uh, uh, issues of identity and uh, existence, uh, particularly the interplay between uh, the individual, the community, and the art resulting from. Uh, the engagement of an artist and the community. Uh, so yeah, there are, there are I, I said that there are problems actually, in fact, uh, that I'd like to discuss. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. Um, so my, my first forays into, into uh, portraiture, and again, he, Johnny looks a little bit puffier than he normally would, um, but my, my first forays into, uh, into portraiture uh, uh, began about 20 some years ago in Hollywood. Uh, a place renowned for its superficiality and, and stylized artifice, uh, I endeavored to, to make portraits of the uh, famous and the uh, not so famous in a fashion that I deemed to be as honest as possible. Uh, honesty is an abstract term. It means different things to different people. In my case, it meant uh, as much as I could removing the mask uh, uh, of persona uh, and, uh, and, and revealing a very kind of human aspect of, of my subject. Uh, I was born in Hollywood, in fact, so I always felt that in some way I was uh, immune uh, from the, uh, from the uh, things that, uh, that, this, the, that which seduced and, and uh, intoxicated people, uh, you know, in, maybe in search of fame. Uh, and uh, the, more, the more people I photographed, the more uh, famous people I photographed, the more I became sort of interested in, uh, in uh, uncovering that, uh, that, that human uh, element, which, which when you look into it, it sort of acts like a mirror and you can see yourself. Um, 
So these would be portraits that uh, ended up in magazines uh, all over the world. Uh, I like to think that in some ways they transcended commercialism. I, I really haven't changed my approach to how I uh, engage my subject. Uh, it's uh, usually a very quick process. Um, and uh, uh, I lived in Los Angeles. These were, these, these, some of these people, you know, it's, it's natural that I would photograph them. They were, they were the citizenry of the, of the, of the place uh, where I lived. Um, couple more. And all I've ever uh, really hoped <clears throat> when I create an image is that when somebody looks into uh, one of these faces, that somehow they might be comforted uh, in, in the sense of sharing something, the human experience, so that you might look, you might look into somebody's face and see yourself or see somebody else, but uh, just, just to, to, to know that you're part of something greater than, than yourself. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's to me, I, I know I've achieved my goal when I, when I get feedback from people that that's the case. So, in January, I, uh, I, uh, I launched a project in uh, Dublin Airport, Terminal 2. Uh, it was a, a shiny new terminal, a beautiful piece of architecture, and it was empty, and they hadn't, uh, they hadn't really considered what they were going to do as far as, uh, uh, as art. They knew they they, at some point they would have to do something. Um, you know, it was a beautiful building with long walkways and nothing really to look at. So. Uh, I photographed, uh, I photographed actually a few hundred uh, citizens of Ireland in all 32 counties. I, uh, this is what it looks like, uh, you know, in situ. Um, the, uh, I love, I, 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 for me, the f is when, I, when I complete a project uh, like this where I, where I uh, work with the community, I, I think that, again, that interplay, not just be b uh, between the subjects, uh, uh, the individuals, the community, and myself, but now with the viewer, the public, it's just very exciting. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very satisfying. So, uh, again, you know, these are photos of, of that, that's my neighbor. Uh, this is uh, a famous actor, uh, a uh, stage actress, famous golfer. These, these would be some, some quite well-known Irish faces. But I hope that when you see them in series like this, uh, you know, you start to uh, get a sense of, of not just the power of the individual image, but the collective. Uh, that's the Prime Minister of Ireland. That's a girl who works at a health food shop. And uh, so this wasn't a commissioned work. A lot of people say to me, wow, that must have been a great commission. But in fact, it wasn't a, a commissioned work. It was something that I had been working on, working on for quite a while. And, uh, uh, it's uh, presenting a, a finished piece of work to an institution. Sometimes uh, uh, you have less uh, problems than you might otherwise because it's a, the, the airport's a semi-state organization, and uh, if 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 the public perceives that the uh, that their tax money was spent on, on an art project, there'll always be those who. Uh, uh, would question why this group of people, why is, uh, why is Jerry Adams, for instance, uh, uh, he was involved with a party in Ireland called Sinn Féin, potentially some people allege that he was a member of the IRA. Uh, so there'd be some people that might have a problem with that, or the former Prime Minister Bertie Ahern, who some people uh, might think had something to do with the economic collapse of, of Ireland. Uh, they might think, why are these people on the walls? They're not heroes. My contention is, no, no, this isn't a series of photos of heroes. Uh, it's a series of uh, the citizenry of, of, a, of a place. You know, I'm, again, I'm trying to transcend reputation, uh, uh, you know, uh, so social status, all of these things, and, uh, or at least open up uh, you know, uh, uh, this thought process as to uh, what you're looking at beyond uh, public persona. Um, I, uh, the, 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 the difficulty, is, it, you never know where it's going to come from either, uh, but it's, it's, uh, the, there, there is a problem. Not, not, it's not always uh, possible to create art uh, you know, and, and self-fund, or, uh, or in my case, it's, it's, just, it's really not an expensive proposition. Time, obviously, is, uh, is, uh, is an issue, but uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, what I do uh, is, is an expensive proposition. Um, 
I went to Istanbul for the City of Culture uh, 2010, and I wanted to see if what I what I what I what I do, the thing that I do, which I, I work very quickly, I was, would be able to do with people I, if I don't speak the language. So I don't speak Turkish. Uh, I wanted to see if I could spontaneously uh, uh, engage people on the street. And so these are some of the pictures from a project called Citizens Istanbul. I did a hundred. Uh, and again, you know, you can't, it's not a scientific study. It's not a perfect, you know, anthropological study of, of, a, of, a, of a people, um, you know, comprised of all demographics and, and every possible type of uh, uh, citizen you could have. But, uh, for instance, I noticed uh, some Turkish people uh, who, who visited the exhibition, they said there's a surprising amount of, uh, of Kurds in the show. And that became a little bit of an issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you can't please everybody. Uh, that's, that's just the way it is. Um, I've, uh, I've spent the last seven months uh, with the help of Marcel and Steffi from DLD and my friend Patty Cosgrave from Founders Web Summit photographing uh, people in the, in the tech sector. Uh, a community is not necessarily a localized thing. A community is obviously can be a, a, a global uh, uh, grouping. And I started making portraits. This would be Nicholas Enstrom, the, the founder of Skype, uh, Jack Dorsey, uh, Twitter. Uh, does anybody know this fellow? Mikael Head, uh, Angry Birds, he's the creator of Angry Birds, Jimmy Wales, um, Reed Hastings of uh, Netflix. I, I'm really uh, enjoying this project. Uh, I get to meet some fantastic people and uh, after, after considerable research uh, and analysis, I've come to the conclusion that in fact they're all humans as well. Uh, the, uh, I have about 250 uh, portraits so far of people, even people in the, you know, involved with venture capital, uh, uh, all aspects of tech. And as I said, I, I find it very difficult to travel without starting a new project. Uh, so I sort of cheated. I've already had some people like this, but like Arkady Voloz from, from Yandex, uh, Eugene Kaspersky uh, from uh, Kaspersky, uh, Andrei Andreev, Badu. Yulia, I don't know if she's here. I saw her floating around. Yulia Mitrovic. Um, so uh, I'm 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 very excited now to, to start uh, a, a Moscow project, not just uh, with faces from tech, but uh, also from uh, uh, all walks of life. And uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be a Moscow thing or uh, 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 all of Russia. But what am I doing? Why am I doing this? When do I stop? You know, this I, I have no uh, no. Uh, uh, ambition to, to, to keep this up for too much longer. You know, it's not like I want to spend the rest of my days uh, just go, going from city to city doing this. Um, you know, uh, this, 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 this format with this homogenized, democratized image uh, uh, of the citizen. But cross-pollination, again, another, uh, another uh, uh, concept that, that I love. Uh, and, and I was talking about leveraging culture uh, for various uh, uh, various reasons one might want to. A, a, a nation might want to leverage their culture to uh, project to uh, other nations that it's a, a healthy uh, environment to set up shop. Uh, it could be uh, leveraging culture to enhance uh, pride within a community. And if you look here, these, these are six, uh, six cities where I, I've uh, either finished a project or uh, am embarking on, on, a, on a new one. Reykjavik, Dublin, Paris, Copenhagen, Novi Sad in the autonomous region of Vojvodina and uh, at Moscow. So uh, it's interesting. I start by completing the work and then I do an exchange. I pick two cities to uh, exchange uh, the exhibition uh, in a public space. So I contact the Ministry of Culture, uh, institutions locally, and so far I've been fortunate that uh, people respond to the, the, the concept. Uh, it seems to, you know, they, they, they seem to get that it's positive within the community, it's positive uh, for, for uh, visitors to their community to uh, have this uh, very uh, healthy, uh, honest representation of, of the citizenry. The, the step that I like after this that's, that's nice, you know, uh, the people in Reykjavik get to see some Dublin faces, uh, Paris get to see Novi Sad and vice versa. But when you play this out, these six cities, you end up with 36 connections. 
And the work's been done, essentially. You know, I've done my part. And I just love that there's this life afterwards. There's this life afterwards that uh, it can be used, it can be exploited. And I, I often use the word ex to, uh, you know, ex exploitation, exploit in a positive sense. Um, I, uh, I love hearing ideas from other people uh, in the communities on how they might use uh, what I do to uh, enhance their agenda. I mean, I know there are some words there like uh, exploit and agenda, which are of, uh, frequently used in a negative context. But uh, as of uh, today, nobody's really, I think, uh, used my, my work for nefarious uh, 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 plans. But essentially, uh, that's it. I'm, uh, I'm going to take my, uh, my tech uh, series. And on June 14th and 15th, uh, I, I, I think it's the first time anybody's done it, on 22 electronic uh, uh, billboards in Times Square, New York, we're going to do, uh, I'm going to show about 150 of the portraits. Um, for two days, and uh, uh, I think a million people come by uh, a day through Times Square. Which, that's exciting. Uh, the, the airport is really remarkable. The one in Dublin, you, you know, the population of the whole island is a few million, but uh, already in the seven months, uh, they tell me that seven million people would have walked past the, uh, the, the, the show. And that's, you know, the museum, the, the museum in Dublin, if I, had, if I had the same show in there, I'd be lucky if I got 200,000, you know, in a year. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not obsessed with, uh, you know, the amount of people who, who see my work, but it's exciting. I mean, it is exciting to know that that many people, not that they all look at it, you know, and it's not that they, some people walk by, they're texting, they don't even, I've met people who have actually missed the whole show. I don't know how, but they, they, they miss these things. But. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, have been invited here to, uh, to DLD and share a little bit about what I'm about and, and what I've been up to lately. Thanks. If, you, if, there were, if there were a question, I'd be happy to answer. If there's not, I understand. <laughs> What can you learn? Amusing. Oh, okay. My question to you is why is it amusing? But um, what can you learn? Uh, I would hope you would learn a little bit more about yourself. I would, I would hope. It's my goal. I'm not saying that it would happen with everybody, but uh, uh, were you to stand before one of these images, or perhaps even afterwards come up to me and I show you some on my iPad and take some time to look at, that, look at them, I would, uh, I would really hope you would learn something more about yourself. I would hope, uh, and, th and that may sound like a fantastical concept, but I would, I would hope that you would look at the image and you would see a vulnerability that you might recognize in yourself. And that vulnerability, I would also hope, uh, would empower you. Uh, and it's a fragility that all humans have. Uh, and that's, that's why I would just hope you would uh, be comforted. It's not so much about learning something. This isn't an academic, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, could have, I could certainly give an academic presentation of what I've done, but I, I think uh, that's like too easy, you know. I'm more interested in, uh, uh, I think I said before, the sort of the ontological nature of uh, the experience, the exchange between the viewer and my, uh, and my work. I don't know if that helps at all, but come up afterwards, we take a look, yeah. Oh. Because it seems to me that the definition, I mean, yeah. first of all, you seem to need to express what you are doing in words. You seem to, to enjoy theorizing about your. Oh, your interesting. Which is hmm. it's not at all the criticism, but it's yeah. common to all artists. Right. And possibly as a consequence of that, you seem to be naming the specificity or singularity of what you do in terms which strikes, strikes me as being. I love this. Oh, I love this. See, this is better. This is much better. Yeah. I'd prefer... Mm. Yeah. I would never refer to myself as a photographer my, myself, by the way. I know they did in the program. <laughs> ah. Okay. Yeah.
exceptionally unusual. I certainly don't claim to be unusual. I've actually thought of my own work as being banal. The idea that I have all these theories about my work, I can tell you that uh, for the first many years, I, I, my, my, what I do, in fact, is I don't think. I stay out of my own head when I work. Any ideas about the nature of my work, the impact of my work, what I try to get out of my work, it's something that comes after the fact, right? Hmm? People ask me to talk about it. But in fact, but in fact I, I would be much more comfortable. I don't know if you can tell. I mean, I'm not, uh, this is fun. This is great. I mean, yeah, we could talk all day. But, but in fact, I would hope that the work, uh, you know, speaks for itself. Uh, and I don't have an agenda. I don't want to be a famous artist. I don't want to uh, change the world. I don't want to teach this gentleman back there anything. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and God, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm being defensive because, uh, no, it's quite the, but I love what you're saying. I love where you're going with that. And it's interesting, but I don't think my works exceptional, no. In fact, uh, I mentioned about how in, you know, Hollywood stylized artifice, uh, for years I would look at other photographers who, uh, uh, you know, I would uh, very quickly uh, uh, judge in some way as being dishonest, you know, not that that's wrong, not that that's bad, the stylized artifice which aesthetically I absolutely appreciate and I would, and I, I still do, it just doesn't work with me. I, you know, as a, as a commercial artist for years, you know, you try to reinvent yourself uh, in the same way so people, the celebrities have personas, you know, you as an artist have a persona, the words I choose right near, the, the, right now, the manner I deal with you, it's all a persona. I hope it doesn't come off as uh, is uh, uh, uncomfortable, you know, because I'm quite comfortable with it. But uh, the the uh, um, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, too concerned really with uh, uh, w you know the uniqueness uh, of what I do. Uh, I, I know that it is what I do. It's the, it, I had to, at some point, you know, at 42, I don't know, maybe at 35 or 30 even, you know, I just decided, well, this is what I do. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing that I enjoy doing, uh, the, 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 my process and what I get out of it, the way I learn about myself through the work, that, that, uh, that just, it, th it thrills me, you know. And if, if I can manage to, this is fairly new to me, you know, I've actually never shown, uh, I've known, you know, from my commercial work, you know, my pictures that I've done, you know, are uh, 500 magazine covers, all of that kind of thing, but I've actually never shown in galleries. I've never had a solo show in a gallery, yet my work's been in museums all over the world, retrospective solo shows, and I think that's quite interesting, actually. I didn't come up, I'm not, my background's microbiology, you know, I've been surrounded by art my whole life. I'm not, a, I'm not a, 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 I've taught, I've lectured at art schools, some of the best in the world, but I'm not, uh, I, I'm not trained, you know, academically in, in, in art. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a non-traditional -tradi non path, you know. Um, and, uh, and there was a time, uh, perhaps, where I had a chip on my shoulder about that, too, you know, about, uh, I don't know if I would, anyone would consider me an outsider artist, but, you know, it's possible. Maybe I'm an outsider, you know, but I'm comfortable with that, too, you know. Thank you for such a like. <laughs> Yes? Uh, you were uh, saying that you were uh, making, taking pictures of citizens, but yes. I'm, I heard um, you mentioned that uh, this person is is known for that, and this person is known for that. Yes. So is that in fact you you making you taking pictures of uh, distinguished citizens, not no. just regular? No, ones? no, no, no. In fact, it's the juxtaposition of uh, I, this is a personal thing. I, I, I suppose I could photograph all known people or all unknown people. But no, in fact, I, I, I didn't mention that when, uh, when I show these pictures, you know, there's, there are no titles, there's no names. So in fact, like the Irish, the Irish exhibition, let's say out of 250 photos, I would say at least 100, everyone in Ireland would know who these people are, everyone. And I would say of any non-Irish person who would visit Ireland, maybe you would know four or five faces, you know. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, like, uh, I like challenging the audience. Uh, of, uh, of a series of photos uh, to ask me a question like that. Uh, specific, I do like when they say, like, why this person, why not this person? Because, in fact, my, my, my puzzle, my game, my challenge is to, uh, to myself is to, as best as I can, remove uh, uh, this persona and this cloak and the masks uh, as best as I can, and hopefully you see beyond uh, the, the, that which you, you think, uh, you know, you already uh, have, have determined that the, the person may be like something like that.
But they all are kind of special in their own way. I mean, you don't uh, take pictures of uh, regular people like, you know, a Did housewife you? or... Well, no, I, I absolutely do. I mean, I, and I showed people there who were housewives and a nine-year-old girl next door and, uh, you know, uh, a, a woman, uh, uh, somebody I was walking into a shop the other day and this, uh, this girl came up to me and she said, you know, I really like your photos, uh, but uh, I, I'm, uh, I don't think it's an accurate portrayal of, of uh, uh, Irish society. And I'm like, well, again, it's not a, it's not a scientific study. I said, but what was the problem in particular? He said, well, you don't have anybody in there with Down syndrome. Uh, I actually did. I actually, the funny thing is, is that because I did, had such a large sampling of people, I have black people, I've got Polish people, I've got people with Down syndrome, I've got athletes, I've got doctors. I've, in fact, I, I did strangely end up with like every possible, you know, travelers, uh, Irish gypsies, you know, <laughs> they're, they're all represented, you know, but it wasn't my intention. You know, if any of these uh, segments of society would have been left out, I wouldn't uh, feel, uh, you know, guilty or anything. So that was a random selection, right? It, well, what's random, really? You know, what's random? You know, uh, I mean, some people, is random when some, someone walks down the street and I look at them. A lot of people come up to me and say, I have a great face for you. I know this woman, my neighbor, she's got a great face. It's like, I don't know what a great face is. I just, they're all great faces to me. And, uh, and uh, um, so, no, it's, I, I don't know what random is. And, you know, and, and, and the thing is, someone may, may not be a friend of mine, and then after I photograph them, they become a friend. So I don't really see the... The, 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 you know, that, that doesn't concern me really, no, but thanks. That's it, that's it, oh, yes. <laughs> this is better, I like Q&A. Uh, hello. hello. Uh, we actually want to know where and when can we find your works in Moscow, and <laughs> if we can, yeah. and uh, is it radio or is it ready? No, no. It's something that I, I've uh, inadvertently started, and that's and that's the funny thing is that sometimes I'll work on a series, and then within the series there's another series, and I don't know if within that series there's ever a series, but there could be. But no. So like in my tech series, I found out that in fact I had already photographed a number of, uh, of interesting Russian subjects, and on previous trips here I photographed in the same style. Uh, I have a, I don't know, maybe I've only got 50, 60 uh, portraits right now that would represent Moscow. Uh, but no, I'll be coming back subsequent trips, uh, five or six trips. When it would be exhibited, no idea. My, uh, b based on personal obligations, I'd like it to be done by the end of the year. Okay, thank you so much. That's a self-portrait. And like I said, 10% stretch. So I, I, well, oh, no, I'm here. So I mean, good Russian food, you know. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Dobryuta. Um, my name is Jens Meurer. I'm a filmmaker and a film producer from Germany, and I brought a friend and colleague, Johnny O'Reilly, who's um, you know a good connection, an Irish filmmaker, um, but he lives around the corner here in Moscow and is making Russian films. Dobryuta. <laughs> My uh, theme this morning, I guess, is I, you know, I'm, I'm a film producer who works in many different countries, so even though we're based in Germany, we're currently involved in co-producing a big Formula One movie, Ron Howard's film Rush, which is the story of James Hunt and Nicky Lauda in the 70s. Another one is um, uh, a film with Vanessa Redgrave and Terence Stamp called The Song for Marion. But my, my special love and interest in making films is actually uh, making films in and with Russia. And in my case, my history goes back to that my first uh, paid day of proper work on a film crew was not very far away from here, just across the river. Uh, on Red Square on the 1st of May 1990. That was my first day ever working with a proper film camera as an, as an employee of the Leningrad Documentary Film Studio um, in what was then a co-production between West Germany, East Germany and the Soviet Union uh, for film, a documentary series that kept me working in Russia for three years. Uh, by the time it was finished, East Germany didn't exist anymore, and uh, nor did the Soviet Union. But I had uh, had a lot of experience, and I had the chance to travel everywhere in this country, and that led to me working in Russia continuously since uh, 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 for you know the 20 years since then. 
And I will show you before introducing you to what Johnny is doing and the, the project I'm working on. Uh, I thought I'd bring two trailers of two quite different Russian co-productions that I was involved with and uh, show you the, the American trailers for these films that were both pretty successful for art house films. They're, they're in fact very successful. And the first one, Russian Art by Alexander Sakurov, Hiroski Kovchyak in, in Russian, is I think actually still one of the most successful Russian films internationally since the Second World War, and it's a German co-production. And um, I'll show you two minutes of it as an introduction, the trailer. If we can run it, please. Russian Ark. <laughs> Russian Ark um, is a film I'm very proud of. It's uh, also the first digital film that was ever shown in the Cannes Film Festival in competition. Didn't win anything. Um, but it's, it's a project that was really only possible to make in Russia because I think everywhere else uh, the red tape would have been just impossible and the, the in a way the uh, the just complete faith Alexander Sakurov had in the possibility of even making the film in the first place uh, is an example of um, the strength and the belief of, uh, that you find here in cultural matters that I think in our case was a very happy combination of kind of the more German things organizing the technology and the Russian things in it um, uh, telling the story that travels through 300 years of Russian history. It was a co-production between my company and the State uh, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg and, uh, and was distributed surprisingly successfully in every country of the world. Um, I'll show you now a, a brief trailer of a much more recent film, only two years ago, that I'm equally proud of, but it's a very, very different kind of Russian co-production. It's a film called, in English, The Last Station. In Germany, it was called A Russian Summer. And it's the story of Lev Tolstoy's uh, last year and the separation from his wife, uh, starring Christopher Plummer and Helen Mirren, who is actually Russian. Uh, she is christened Yelena Mironova, and um, both got an Oscar nomination for this film. I'd just like to show you the trailer quickly. Again, a German-Russian co-production. Nothing British or American in this film uh, on the financing side. If we could run it, please. If you were to become Tolstoy's private secretary, you would be given a great gift. We have a lot to do if we are to get his work to the people. So glad you're here! Oh, I sneeze sometimes when I get nervous. I believe that wealth corrupts us all. It's a keystone of the movement. Oh, God, I know all about the movement. I want you to keep a diary. Anything the Countess says. The survival of our movement depends upon it. I cannot stand by while they steal my children's inheritance. But you all think he's Christ, don't you? He thinks he's Christ. I have a little gift for you. It's a diary. It's right what you see around you. What you see. <laughs> You've been keeping something from me. Have I? Tolstoy does not approve of sexual relations. I know this. This would not be a problem with me. I'm a vegetarian. I am celibate. The Countess is too interested in making a profit from your work. Oh, dear! Oh, God! You're all plotting against me in my own house! They have a whole life together. Why do you have to deny that? You've become a victim of her romantic nonsense. What do they know about love? I love a romance. Hey, you make up! Well, you don't need a husband. You need a Greek chorus. Love cannot be weak-minded. It cannot be stupid. Well, Ma doesn't understand my father's goals. I mean, isn't that what it's about? Freedom and love. He's her entire life. The work in her mind is theirs together. I've never stopped loving you. Of course. But God knows you don't make it easy. I've behaved rather badly, haven't I?
Well, this is an altogether different German-Russian um, co-production. Our Russian partner was the production center of Andrei Kanchalovsky. Um, and even though this was not the original plan at all, one of the weird things about this film is that it's telling a great, great, great Russian story. Um, but it's written and directed by an American and acted with a British-Canadian cast. And um, weirdly enough, none of it was filmed in Russia, which was entirely due to financial reasons, but it did lead to the Tolstoy family becoming close friends because they opened up the home of Vladimir Tolstoy, who's now an advisor to President Putin, um, uh, runs the Yasna Polyana estate, and we would have gladly filmed them. They would have gladly had us film there, except uh, probably would have broken the estate with the whole film crew moving in. And so ultimately it was fo uh, filmed in different parts of, of East Germany. But it's a film that uh, traveled the world and um, I think it's a good example for something that I just want to mention in this brief introduction this morning, which is that there is kind of a massive cultural proximity between Western Europe and, and Russia, and there's also a great divide. Uh, for example, when we're making this film, um, researching painstakingly as much as we could in Russia, in the original locations, we visited the place where Tolstoy died, uh, um, a, a place now called Lev Tolstoy. You can get there on the train. It's still the original deathbed. It's a museum now. We did all this, but we ran into real trouble with some of the ladies running the archive at Yasna Polyana because they really didn't like the fact that we're not focusing on the great man, but on his wife, Sofia Tolstoy. Uh, and I thought this project might be all wrong and it was foreigners doing it. Um, I think ultimately it, it wasn't all wrong. It was a way of telling a Russian story in the English language. Um, obviously it's Tolstoy that the whole world knows and reveres in such a way that the story actually traveled. And one of the challenges that uh, all great filmmaking nations who aren't using the English language have is that their films find it harder to travel uh, than anything shot by Hollywood or, or British filmmakers. And that's what we experience as Germans, and that's what Russians experience very much as well. That led to a reasonably long period of time when uh, following uh, a very one-sided but active co-production period where big Russian directors like Pavel Lungin and Alexander Sokurov were making their films often in the Russian language but with French and German producers. There was a time of just Russian, you know, and those films often didn't do very well in Russia. There was a time of big Russian blockbusters, um, big Russian war comedies, entertainment films that had a big audience here in Russia as sort of cinema re-emerged after the following the Soviet period, but no one else in the world saw them. I'm kind of hoping that we are now moving into uh, a period of time when co-production, when making uh, films together in Europe to tell local stories, to tell German stories, to tell Russian stories, sometimes the stories we have in common, uh, is, is becoming the, uh, the, 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 the new thing. And uh, it's a very interesting experience because there's a lot of resistance in Russia to this. Um, uh, there's a lot of debate in Russia about whether this is even the right thing. And while all this is going on, Russian culture and Russian cinema is being uh, swamped by the Hollywood product in the same way that it has happened to uh, us in Germany and, uh, and you know most other countries in Europe that um, uh, have a market share of 80% for American films and if they're lucky 5, 10, 15, maybe 20 if it's a good year of their own product and even fewer films that are common European films. So um, that is something that really drives me. And before I uh, hand over uh, to Johnny, I want to mention briefly the two very Russian projects that I'm working on at the moment. Um, and I hope that I can get off the ground sooner rather than later. One is a, is a grand, grand, grand Russian and sadly <laughs> German story. It's the siege of Leningrad, the 900-day siege, um, about which no big 
internationally successful film has been made yet. There have been some films made, um, uh, but none that have really reached out to people and reached a wide audience, which, uh, which I think, considering how many stories of the Second World War uh, have been filmed, is quite extraordinary. Our film, uh, which is again a co-production between myself and the producer Andre Deryabin, who works with the Hermitage um, Museum in St. Petersburg, focuses on an extraordinary event and an extraordinary cultural event during, during that siege, namely the performance of uh, Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, the Leningrad Symphony, in the middle of, in the, middle of the, the, the siege, which, which was ex very, very difficult to, to stage. It was the idea, the work was commissioned by Stalin, uh, Shostakovich was living here in Moscow, uh, to rally the population, the troops, not just in St. Petersburg, but in Russia around the war effort. It's a rousing piece, it's a fantastic piece of music. Many people believe there are actually many hidden messages of criticism of Stalinism in it. And the fact that they were planning to perform it in the middle of the war in St. Petersburg Petersburg um, was a real challenge. First of all, uh, they didn't have the musicians anymore. The, the orchestra was disbanded. Even getting the, um, uh, the, the notes um, for the orchestra into the city, you know, there was no email, no fax. It had to be flown in. The Germans had heard about it. They were aiming to shoot down the plane um, that had the music sheets on it. All this makes an extraordinary story. In a way, it's actually a little bit like the Blues Brothers, um, you know, not really, but uh, you had to get the band together again. You had to find the musicians. In the case of St. Petersburg and Leningrad, it meant you had to find people who maybe couldn't play anymore because they'd become so weak. If they were still alive, they had to find a place that was halfway safe where they could practice this new piece of music. They had to arrange for it to be broadcast over the radio. Um, our project is called The Symphony. Again, a lot of debate whether it should be shot in Russian language or in the English language. I think we'll do it in the English language because that's the one way we can reach a worldwide audience. And um, we hope to be making this film sooner rather than later. Uh, and my second biggest uh, big Ru Russian project is actually the biggest love story never told on screen. And it's a story that even most Russians are not very aware of, but it's a true story. And it's the love between Catherine the First, not Catherine the Great, and Peter the Great, uh, which is really extraordinary because Catherine, later the, the first of five Tsarinas who ruled Russia for nearly 100 years in the uh, 18th century, uh, was actually, you know, she wasn't an aristocrat. Uh, she, was, uh, she wasn't even Russian, she was Polish. Her real name was Marfa. She, uh, she kind of was swept up during the war against Sweden and ultimately encountered Peter the Great, who in an extraordinary moment in history said, you are the woman of my life, and decided that this woman who was no one would be his closest aide and his lover and his best friend by his side until he died. And, just before he passed away, he made sure she would become the, the ruler of the largest country in the world as a woman. She was 40 when this happened, but it only lasted for two years because she loved him so much that she lost the will to live and she followed him into the grave two years later. Again, that's a big St. Petersburg story. They're the two who started that city together that we're hoping to make as a big international co-production. And that's one of the projects that takes me to Russia regularly. Um, I've also made films in Georgia uh, with people like Irak Likvirikatze, Nana Georgiatze. Um, we've made uh, commercials, we've made television series, TV movies in Russia and the former republics. Often when you speak to people internationally, there's still a lot of prejudice. You can't uh, rely on people here, you can't trust people. The mafia, my experience has been completely the opposite. I find um, that if you're maybe at the right level, and the right level might be a cultural level and not really a money level, because as a filmmaker, you, 
you're never really a businessman and you're not really dealing with the business many you're kind of maybe dealing with them because you're getting some money from somewhere but you're actually dealing with other filmmakers and you're dealing with producers and you're dealing with um, writers and directors and if you are on that level in Russia uh, my experience is that it's actually the most reliable place and the most rewarding place to make films in in Europe I mean you know certainly compared to deal making with the French or even the Americans um, uh, I think this is a place that has a lot of potential for bigger international films it has the stories it has the history of filmmaking it has uh, the people who are making films here but it needs to be awakened a little bit uh, I was fortunate enough to be on a journey with our then foreign uh, minister called Steinmeier um, a few years ago uh, a couple of weeks after the previous president came to power and we went to Yekaterinburg and we looked at the cathedral where the Romanovs are buried and um, you know that was obviously a, an important the delegation and moving moment in Russian history but if you turned around and faced the other way you would have seen a multiplex cinema that they built just opposite and as we were looking at that seminal place in Russian history you had the multiplex and they were just playing Star Wars and Spider-Man and uh, that, that's all you saw so I strongly believe that there is a collaboration between Russia and the rest of Europe and the rest of the world a, a cultural um, opportunity uh, that there's a reawakening that we should be working towards, I'm working towards and, and I have with me um, an Irish filmmaker who is doing just that in um, you know a slightly unusual way and you'll say a few words about that in a minute he makes Russian films living here in Russia and your most recent film that you finished The Weather Station starring Alexei Guskov a big star here is about to open in the United States Johnny okay thank you um, я не знаю, если я мог говорить по-русски, но, может быть, для... I'll speak in English, so everyone uh, can understand. Um, I am from Ireland. I came here first as a student in 1993. Um, and I'd like to echo a few things that Jan said, uh, specifically about um, the uh, reputation about working in Russia, I have found in my experiences uh, here to be very positive, Russians to be reliable, and uh, but also there, as uh, Jan said, there is a big, uh, there is a lot of cultural affinity between Western Europe and Russia, and also there's a great big divide. And since I came here in 1993, I find myself spending a lot of time and effort trying to bridge that divide. Um, it's becoming easier, but it seems like it's my life's work here in, in Moscow. Um, I've made uh, a couple of films here, one as director, uh, which is called Priatsia, uh, in English, The Weather Station. It's going to open in the US on July the 20th in what I think is going to be the largest uh, distribution of a Russian film since Nochnoy Dazor. So it, I think that's about six years ago. Um, and I'm working on another project called uh, Moscow Never Sleeps. And this is the project that really, uh, th th that I feel very personally about. It's, um, I've always been very aware of, the, uh, of how little people in the West know about Russia. There's not really much of a tourism infrastructure here. People don't visit here very much. When I go back home, people are always, first of all, astounded that I live here, and secondly, very curious to know what it's like, and they know very little about it. So I always wanted to make a film that shows contemporary Moscow to international audiences. The first decision that I made was that it should be a multi-narrative movie with lots of interweaving stories. Um, so right now we're in the middle of casting. Uh, we're about two months away from production on that film. Uh, it stars, um, we've got a lot of different actors involved, um, Vladimir Menshov, Sergei Garmash, um, perhaps Alexei Guskov as well. Um, and that that will be filmed over the summer and in the Russian language and will be released uh, next year. 
I think, do we have a trailer of my last film? This is uh, The Weather Station, a very different type of film to the one that I'm doing at the moment, but... Yeah. Sorry about the sound there, I don't know what happened, but um, that was shot in Simferopol uh, two years ago. It was released here in Russia last year and it's just starting the rounds of its international circuit uh, next July. Um, I'll just finish just by saying two, two, a couple of words about me and my experience in, in, in Moscow. I've lived here altogether for seven years. Uh, I, I really like living here. Um, there's a quite a vibrant expat community here, most of whom are working for large, big companies or they're diplomats or they are uh, English language teachers. I could probably count on one hand the amount of uh, freelancers or you know, artists or people working in the media or arts on a freelance basis, which is strange for uh, the city which has the biggest population in Europe. I think part of the reason is uh, because it's so hard for people to get a visa here. It still feels that kind of closed situation. So, you know, I've, I've been part of an effort to try and convince both the Moscow authorities and the government to ease visa restrictions on visitors here, at least for a weekend or anything like that. And I think that could have a huge impact on um, relations between Russia and the West, especially in the cultural sphere. Very small little change. Um, so if any of you have any uh, political influence, uh, try and bear, bring that to, to bear. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, of course, we'll answer them. Totally non-digital, I brought some paper uh, I've got a little booklet on what my company does. If anyone wants it, I've got a few. But there were one or two questions. Uh, sorry, uh, my name is Alina. So I would like to ask you, and what's the difference between your films and the films which Russian directors are shooting? You, you think you know Russia a little bit better? Or <laughs> That's a, a, a good question. Um, it's, it's hard to answer that question. In, in, in this sense directly, but let me answer it this way. I'm making a film at the moment that is attempting to capture the zeitgeist, let's say, or to capture the spirit of Moscow. And uh, there are some dissenting voices, well, hold on, you're not Russian, you can't make a movie about Russia, you know, you won't be able to understand it fully, as if there is one singular interpretation of what Russia is, as if there's one idea that is Russia. And, you know, it's a bit like saying, you know, a foreigner can't make a movie set or about America, you know? So, really, you know, I'm not trying to make a Russian movie from a Russian viewpoint. I'm trying to make a Russian movie from the viewpoint of someone who has been living here for a while. And I think there are certain things that I would notice that perhaps a Russian wouldn't notice. 
also there are many things that I wouldn't know uh, that Russians do know. So it's just a different angle, a different viewpoint. Um, in, that's really what the difference is between my viewpoint and the Russian viewpoint. I would just approach it differently. I, I would hope that people you know, will enjoy, be informed, be entertained by my movies as much as some of the successful Russian movies. Can you, can you repeat this question? So I just uh, uh, saw a lot of movies which have been done uh, by European di directors and I also saw this movie about Tolstoy and I think it's a, actually it's a good movie because it was shown on uh, Russian TV in one of the programs. So and I think actually it's a very good example. But I just would like to understand your point of view. Uh, what's the difference between what have been done already by some other directors because they are all usually telling the same story and then we see you, you know, we see actually, no, because I'm, uh, I'm start uh, to, to talk about it because I know I saw many films by Alexander Sakurov and I know how he feels the Moscow and actually Russian culture so this is actually a different level of understanding. Maybe it's not for everybody but it's actually uh, true art. That's why I would like to find out what, what kind of movies are you trying to show. You would like to show more pop, uh, pop uh, uh, kind of Moscow or what you would like to say with your films, with your movies, because actually from this uh, trailer I saw that it's actually such kind of topic which is not so different from everything, no, n not so unique, let's put it like this. Yeah, well, the first film, uh, The Weather Station, it was a project which was developed by uh, Russian producer Sergei Selyanov, and he asked me to direct it. Um, so it was their concept, their idea, and I just did the directing work on it. My next film, Moscow Never Sleeps, is all my idea, and hopefully you'll come to see that, and that will answer your question about how different it is to other Russian uh, movies. Um, I, I can't say that I approach it in a Western way as opposed to a Russian way. I'm a different director to other directors, so, um, you know, I mean, it's not as... I, I, I think it's more accessible than many Sakura films. It, you know, it's somewhere between uh, commercial and art house is, 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 is the way people tend to categorize these m movies, you know, when it comes to sales. Um, sorry, you might have something to add to that. Well, I just, I just have one observation, which is something to do with what you said. I think considering how important a country um, Russia is in Europe and how big a city this is in Europe, um, it is a little bit surprising compared to my hometown of Berlin, how much exchange and interchange there is. There are lots of foreign filmmakers, if we talk about film, making films in Germany. Uh, some of the best films about Germany are directors like Billy Wilder who made two fantastic films about Berlin after the war. Uh, you know, it, things are what they are, but it is regrettable how much of a fence there is still around Moscow or Russia. You know, it's not a fence that's very difficult to get through. There is lots of contact if you're looking for it, and it's very rewarding, and it's possible to work together quite easily if you want to do it, but if you look at sheer numbers and you know how many films could be made about Russia, and it, I think it doesn't matter who makes films about Russia. You know, there are some Russian films like The Return that break out and at least win uh, art house prizes, but there could be and should be so much more. And, you know, of course you have oil here. If, if I compare to a city like Berlin that doesn't have very much at all, our big uh, oil is culture. You know, and it's people coming to the city from everywhere in the world who find a way to live there, who find a way to work there. And it's really the lifeblood of a big German city that had to reinvent itself. One wishes that a bit more could be going on in Russia too, and uh, it would only make Russia even prouder. I do, um, gentlemen, uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for the mission you're on. And my question is about the stereotypes. Are you playing with the stereotypes? Uh, and if yes, are you enforcing them or are you breaking them in, in your films? Just both of you if, if you, if you wish. 
I'm uh, avoiding stereotypes at all cost. Um, that's a good question because there are a lot of stereotypes in, 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 all, in all movies and from all cultures. And especially in Russia, I mean, there's a lot of movies that have a Russian character. He's always a gangster or the girl is a prostitute, you know. So, um, and part of the reason for that preponderance of stereotypes in Western movies about Russia is because of, you know, that ring fence, because not many people have visited Russia, because it still feels a bit closed to many people. Um, so for me, like w one of the things that I'm trying to do is to k smash those stereotypes. And I'm hoping with my next movie, you know, if it gets a wide release, that people will be surprised by it. They'll, uh, you know, get to see and feel what real Russian people are like. So that would be my goal, if you like, to, to break those stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, you know, are we, it's cinema. You play with the stereotypes, you break them. Uh, Russian stereotypes are quite fun to play with. When we did The Last Station, we had to reinvent all the stereotypes because it's actually not a very Russian film, but a very Russian story. But it's actually a very Russian story that's a very European story. There's so many accounts of the death of Tolstoy the last year, some of which are by German writers, and they're very good. Um, the first film called The Last Station was made in 1912 in Russia. So we, you know, we... It's, it's fun to play with the Russian stereotypes. I'm not sure if we're very good at it, but um, you know, you saw some of my films, like Russian Ark. Uh, I think that's like taking them and turning them around and turning them around again. The whole fact that it was a West German uh, Russian production with a Russian director who had most of his big films funded by Germans, you know, who was never really part of the the modern establishment here. He's kind of old school, but from a Soviet time when he was uh, not, not an officially a very well received director. That's, put it this way, it's, it's a very interesting place to touch stereotypes. Okay, we have a time for the last question. And, uh, um, hi, my name is Anastasia. I, want, I wanted to say that I saw The Last Station quite currently. It was amazing. I think that every movie is better with Helen, uh, Helen Mirren. And uh, I wanted to ask if um, uh, your story about Leningrad, are you also planning on involving some big names in it? And who would, do you think would be able to portray this heartbreaking story? Who, who would be able to do that? It, it's you. a really difficult question to answer because um, on the one hand you need these big names because that's how you can finance a big film and doing a film about the siege of Leningrad is going to be expensive. On the other hand, uh, you know, when we did the film about the Tolstoys it was easy. It was a personal, bit like what you just mentioned, it was one director's screenplay, it was his story of what happened in, in Jasna Poljana in that year. Uh, there are many others and I'm sure there will be more. When you do a film about the siege of Leningrad, uh, it carries a different, especially if you're German, it carries a different um, historical responsibility. So I think if we had the choice, we would like to make it um, with really unknown actors so that they can become part of an original ensemble, because it will be an ensemble, because we have the orchestra, different parts in that. Uh, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it that way, so we will have, have to think of some star names. And I'm sure that will be a, a hotly discussed um, process. Not everyone will agree with us doing it that way. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question from the lady that does not speak English, so she kindly asked me to translate her question. And uh, the question was, uh, are you planning to participate in the Moscow Film Festival this year? And have you ever participated in the Moscow Film Festival? And what do you think about this? Shooting this film, du uh, the film during the, f the festival, so I'll be unable to participate. Yes, I have participated in the festival. I don't think I have anything this year. 
Um, I would definitely come back. I have a very good memory of the Moscow Film Festival. I did a film with Pierre Richard once, a French actor who, of course, is very popular in Russia. And believe it or not, um, that was my first chance, and it hasn't happened very many often uh, since then, uh, to drive in a stretch limo. Because if you're with Pierre Richard in Moscow, they, he was really looked after very well, and I was lucky to jump in with him. The film was called 27 Missing Kisses, a Russian language film shot in Georgia. Um, was it 1998, you think? Something like that, yes, it was 1998. And um, so that's a great memory. I don't know if you want, if this was your question, I do think that Moscow Film Festival is in trouble. Uh, I think it has something to do with the same thing we mentioned. It's become much more and more... Uh, isolated, you know, it's an A festival, it was one of the really important festivals in the world and to me it's crazy that as a city like Moscow you should not look after a festival like this more. Uh, internationally it's not so important anymore and in Russia as far as I can tell, Sochi, uh, you know, now there's a new festival in St. Petersburg. It's kind of um, lost its orientation a little bit. I hope that it becomes a, a bigger, stronger festival again. Uh, you know, maybe it's something to do with the location, the Novi Abad, it's all not so perfect. But the city needs it, and it's a great place to, it is a great place to show film because the audiences in Moscow are so fantastic. You know, this is a place where people really like film, and they have a lot of film history, they take film seriously, so it's a very good place to visit. I have an infrastructure question. Uh, if you look at uh, France or Paris, uh, they recently kind of stunned me by winning two-thirds of the Oscars uh, for the artist, for, for um, uh, Les Intachables, uh, and production for Hugo and uh, Midnight in Paris and, and so forth. What, what does that community has in place that could probably also help Germany and, and Russia. It seems they have something going for them uh, regarding creating and regarding producing. Um, well, they have a very strong film culture. They have um, a history of, of filmmaking that really is uh, pretty astounding compared to other European countries. They also have very generous grants from the government. I, I think it's a certain percentage of box office receipts goes directly back to the filmmaking community. Uh, so, you know, I, I think all of those factors contribute to a great output of, of, of French movies. They have a huge quantity of, of movies compared to other European countries as well. So you hear about the big hits, you probably don't hear about the big flops as much. Um, but I think to create uh, a, a filmmaking culture that is as successful as France takes a long time, you know. I think there are some steps that Russia could take. I think, first of all, there seems to be a, a, a quite a strong monopoly on film training through the geek. And I think they still use quite a lot of Soviet uh, systems there. I mean, a lot of the young film uh, graduates that I come across are not happy with the level that they get there. And I think if there was another major film school that provided a bit of competition to the geek, that would be a, a good step uh, to, to help nurture a film, uh, to improve the film culture here. Yeah, another observation is that I think the film funding system in Russia not surprisingly, actually, if you think since the, the demise of the Soviet Union has been in, in a slight, a long orientation phase, call it that. Um, there was a total death of cinema here, uh, you know, shortly after the end of the Soviet Union. I think there's been in recent years a kind of not totally helpful debate be kind of, be between kind of cinema nationalism and cinema internationalism. Uh, where cinema nationalism won out and the funding, if there was funding, was for a while oriented towards, you know, the idea of you can do a big national patriotic cinema, but um, you can do that, but it won't travel very much. The new um, recently changed funding structures, I think, are actually quite clever. 
uh, uh, compared to what the support systems we have in other countries. There's a lot of money here, uh, and, and it's a great opportunity, actually. I think there is quite a lot of money in the state funding system, and there seems to be a more co-production-oriented part of it now. Uh, of course, there's also a lot of money in business, partially, you know, uh, something that maybe goes on between these walls as we are sitting here. And uh, if you think of how much money wealthy parts of Russia are spending, even on culture sometimes, and this, that, on the other, uh, most people love film. I'd say uh, there's definitely more to be had in, in, in supporting those bits of, you know, Russia's film, film culture is as strong as France's film culture, and, uh, and the film history is, is equally strong. You know, they're good, good ways, uh, they're good targets for money to be spent, but it's not flowing particularly efficiently at this moment yet. But I'm, I think it's, it's getting better and better. Thank you very much. The wonderful audience, the wonderful speakers. Really appreciate you coming and let's uh, thank our speakers. And, uh, and now uh, we're going to have a fantastic Natalia Sindeva. And she's going to be speaking Russian. So for those of you, please raise hands who do not speak Russian. We'll give you the devices that will, you know, help you to understand what she's speaking. She's a wonderful speaker and she's a beautiful woman. So uh, please, Natasha, welcome on stage. Yes. Good morning. Uh, good, after, good morning. I will speak uh, Russian uh, because uh, for me it will be quite uh, easier like this. Uh, Today, I don't, know how, I don't know how to do this and how to put this in 10-15 minutes. I will speak about the dream and how it's important to dream uh, and uh, how business and dream can co correlate. How important it is uh, not to um, give in. If I could have more time to speak about this, I would speak about business case. Uh, uh, for today, we have a business case uh, with a TV uh, Rain channel. It would be interesting because uh, during the last several years, uh, uh, this is one of not many unique projects, uh, which um, was a startup first, uh, and then it became a quite, quite a big one. We analyzed uh, this recently, and we realized that during last uh, three, four years, nothing bright happened. Uh, if we speak about um, uh, interesting um, channels, but now I won't speak about business case. I will speak about the dream. I uh, I'm little here, and I'm dreaming already here in the picture. 2007, uh, by the time uh, when I became already a producer of radio station and uh, I earned quite enough money, I could afford uh, to stop uh, doing daily work uh, and try to live uh, as a real woman who uh, can bring up children, uh, kids uh, and who can rest, uh, not to go home, not to go to work every day. I uh, st started to think that maybe uh, uh, I will try uh, uh, to uh, uh, go to France and to spend uh, this money in France. And we decided uh, in our family to buy a house um, in France. When I came to France, I uh, started to look for uh, a house. And in France, there was a festival, Metcom, the TV market. I was working there, and I met a lot of friends there in this market, in this festival. And they asked me, what are you doing? I said that uh, for 13 years, Yes, I uh, was doing radio programs, and then I, um, I uh, decided to have a break. And uh, in three days or four days, I understood uh, that I've got an idea to create a, a TV channel. Why? How did I do this? Uh, I've got this idea because uh, of the following. My friends and me, we, st we stopped uh, to watch TV, Russian TV. We stopped to trust uh, Russian TV. We don't like what's happening uh, uh, on this TV, and I was. Uh, uh, scared even to uh, uh, you know to switch on TV uh, if my kid is around because I, I, I you know never know what uh, program you can uh, uh, see and you know um, of course uh, TV is very important for us and we like to click this uh, channels uh, to switch between channels but at one point of time we all stop to do this uh, but for me uh, you know I have a very interesting um, uh, you know viewers. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't have such a nice channel and uh, uh, we need a 
channel for people who stopped to look uh, for some information news on TV. Maybe for uh, advertisers, um, maybe uh, advertisers would uh, get interested in this, uh, in these people, in these target people. And I decided to do this TV channel like this. When I was uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere on the show France, and I was with my friend, TV producer, uh, he he showed me how um, he showed me how the uh, TV process uh, is happening here. Um, uh, you know, uh, spoke about content, about business models on TV. And um, uh, when I'm speaking about TV, uh, you should understand that in Russia uh, there is Air TV. These are 20 main basic channels. Uh, all channels for today uh, are owned by the state mostly or affiliated uh, companies. Uh, uh, you know, um, which are also linked with the state, with the government. These are 20 channels, and they split all ad pi. These are basic channels, and the coverage, uh, you know, uh, is 100% practically. And also, there is one more part. Uh, this is not uh, air cable or satellite uh, channels, now also internet. Uh, this is uh, not covered by these 20 channels, uh, state channels. When I was streaming about TV channel, I was streaming about the channel who could be uh, alternative uh, and it could be cable or satellite and uh, at that point of time when I started to dream about this uh, uh, there was already 300 uh, channels like this satellite or internet and I was not scared because I understood that all these channels uh, uh, they are very narrow and that's why I, I will do another channel uh, which will be um, a little bit different and everybody uh, uh, would like it it was like it was in 20 2007 for the whole year for the entire year I was dreaming about this here you can see the picture Moscow City uh, you know as girls have this when you start to dream I, I even uh, did not know anything specific I only knew that it would be very beautiful I there will be my cabinet my room where I would work um, good people would work there and also I knew ideologically that I uh, want to uh, make a Russian open TV and when I was imagining the studio, you can see this room, I imagined that this is an open space, open windows, and this space is, uh, in this space, uh, there is camera, studio, and everything we produce. And we also work uh, this. So this is like uh, a single home, uh, the, the home. Uh, you know, I also invited three more girls. One was a uh, director, another is an editor. She's uh, also here behind the glass and she helps us. And the producer, a producer. And this uh, producer understood a lot about TV in the process. It was the only person who understood this, uh, this process, TV process. Of course, uh, there were a lot of challenges uh, when we started to invent this uh, channel. It was, uh, you know, a startup. A and entrepreneurship when you don't know what you will have in, in the future you don't have a business plan you come to a company and you say please I need a technology help me and um, okay what format they ask what does it mean HD or SD what is it I ask and then they explain what it is and you uh, already understand uh, HD maybe that's why uh, it concerned every stage like this was uh, the each stage uh, stage was like this and then uh, there was technical documentation and they say uh, you, we uh, made up you a complex of things and you don't understand anything in these documents but you need uh, to make uh, some kind of decision uh, then you open this uh, documents uh, you uh, have a technical person uh, nearby and you ask a lot of questions uh, and then um, only you um, um, you know accept this or you refuse uh, to do something only like this uh, we worked uh, we were doing first uh, everything on paper we found a place and in September uh, you know I remember how we were coming from Italy to Moscow I need to I need to sign a contract uh, and 250 square meters beautiful I had a ready plan technology construction plan and we needed to sign the contract and to start this process uh, that day uh, there was a, a plane uh, delayed and we don't have time to sign the contract and uh, we delayed this for tomorrow and tomorrow you know uh, there was a cri the crisis uh, uh, erupted 
my husband is a banker and he was uh, one uh, who of the first who, be who becomes a bankrupt practically I uh, felt at the loss uh, and uh, you know I uh, understood that it was uh, uh, quite uh, good that we did not sign this contract and then I stop already and then I and also I'm pregnant you know and um, then suddenly I understand that uh, I want still I want to, to get uh, to, to, to have this uh, two channel but I was really uh, you know scared because I've never done this radio uh, you know um, I had a lot of partners I had uh, a very good partner uh, you know manager constructor he knew everything and he uh, tackled all questions besides creative ideas and ideas and here uh, you know I was responsible for everything responsible for all ideas I needed uh, also to be responsible for money and um, at that point of time as any person I I was really scared and I made a decision uh, to stop uh, myself and then uh, I uh, let people go I say girls um, you know um, please um, uh, go away I I feel uh, depressed and also I'm pregnant you know and uh, maybe that's why I'm depressed I don't know also uh, you know I uh, wrote uh, a book uh, a hymn to capitalism uh, that uh, you need to be confident in yourself, you need to uh, be resistant to any um, circumstances. And then I uh, feel a little bit better. And the second book, uh, uh, an American book, uh, uh, think and re and get rich or something. And the first three pages were dedicated to this, that you need to believe in your dreams and never refuse from your dreams. Because if you dream, if you believe in your dream, everything helps you. And then you will achieve your results. But if if you betray your dreams, if you are scared, if you are a coward, if you refuse from your dreams, if you, you know, are under circumstances, you will never succeed. And then when I read this book, I understood everything. I understood that all this depression is coming from from my pregnancy, maybe. And then I understood that I need to continue. I wake up in the morning, I gather everybody, and I say to them, oh, we continue to work. Then we, uh, uh, you know, after crisis, of course, it was very difficult, and then all budgets, all conditions we planned, uh, they were changed. We uh, start uh, to look for uh, some kind of building, and then we found the Red October factory in the center opposite uh, the Kremlin, an empty uh, uh, factory. Of course, there are no, ch there is no chocolate anymore, no sweets, and uh, you know, uh, we uh, wanted to rent um, this space. We come there and uh, we understood that this is ideal for us. You know, the smell of chocolate, chocolate uh, shop. And this is uh, this is our future channel, TV channel. We understand that it should be here. But still uh, there was no um, contract sign. And they said to us you can come here, but uh, still there will no be registration and uh, no strict uh, uh, terms. You know, this are details. Why I am speaking about this? Because again, this is a problem, and you understand that uh, you don't have a solution here. Because you, we looked, we we saw all objects in Moscow, and all, we only wanted this place. I do, did not want to give to give up. We are I'm, we are now here again. We are also here in the, at the territory of this Red October factory. We were the first one uh, who decided to convince um, the organizers of this. Um, uh, uh, event. Uh, so I uh, said to them that it should be a very fashionable, it would be a very fashionable place in Moscow. It would be very important. And then uh, again, um we managed to convince them in renting uh, this place. This uh, is our uh, space, and if you want, uh, if you would like uh, to, to see uh, our TV channel uh, space, uh, I can bring you there if you want. Uh, this is um, is uh, now looks of course uh, now it looks of course different, and here in this place uh, there are a lot of interesting rooms. If we come back again. In 2009, we signed the contract, and in the middle of 2009, we start uh, 
again we uh, we, we changed everything because the TV uh, channel was um, like this so that each centimeter of this space uh, of this uh, place uh, should be studio like uh, studio wise and from each point you can go air that's why this technology building was very linked with this space with this building that's why we lacked a experience by this uh, um, uh, 2000 meters uh, which were in this chocolate shop uh, each centimeter was very valuable we wanted to know um, where each person would see it and then coming back I understand uh, you know I you know uh, it was very difficult air conditioning uh, uh, you know um, heating uh, sand um then, of course, there were only girls, only two technical people. Uh, and then we started to construct a TV channel. We start to repair all this. So we uh, have the budget. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I you know, wanted this budget to allocate for my um, house, but still I needed to use this money. I wanted uh, to realize this dream. And then um, suddenly, when we were in the process of ordering the equipment, uh, in the process of, of uh, maintenance repairing works. Our technical subcontractors uh, who uh, wanted to give us equipment, they say, well, we have camera and uh, equipment, but still, uh, what software would you have? And then I uh, hear this word uh, for the first time during these two years. What soft are you speaking about? But we are uh, speaking about HD technology and the digital technology. There should be a brain somehow. You know, you need to find a soft which would cope with these tasks. And we start to look for the software. We go to uh, the largest TV exhibition. And in 2009, there was no any solution, not a single solution which uh, could uh, afford um, uh, to convert this uh, HD technology um, into very um, quick modes. Um, all um, large producers of softs, and there are several of them. You know, and the second, uh, um, you know, was uh, soft uh, was much more expensive than hardware we ordered, and. Um it was also very difficult. Then there was again something like an exam, you know, what uh, should I do next? There is equipment, there is uh, uh, repair, but still we lack uh, uh, as something which uh, would make everything work. Uh, we, within one month and a half, we started a lot. Uh, we went uh, to the biggest producers and they uh, could not help us at all. Uh, they say uh, we need to test, we need to do a lot of work, and then suddenly, by accident, uh, um, we found out there that there are some Italian guys, and maybe they have some kind of solution. Because um, Italians, you know, uh, they uh, are not very popular with software developments, but uh, we come to them, we come to their stand, and they show us uh, their solution. Our technical consultant, uh, he says, he has this, they have this solution. We are happy. I understand, okay, I, I, I did not give up, and now I'm managed to do this and this was quite cheaper the solution okay, yeah. and I, I think that's the bingo so I get back to Moscow uh, to the hardware supplies for TVs so uh, they say that uh, okay we looked at this uh, software but uh, uh, it won't work most probably, so we won't uh, do the installation and uh, uh, we won't be responsible for that. Uh, I was uh, in tears because of that and so they said that uh, we have the equipment, but uh, no installation will be provided. So we had to make some decisions whether we should suspend the whole operation or we should uh, carry on. So I call my technical director and uh, ask him whether we should uh, suspend everything or we should do everything ourselves without uh, the supplies. So we take uh, the uh, hardware and integrate this uh, Italian uh, software ourselves. Well, it's a very high responsibility because uh, there are no uh, guarantees or warranties uh, from the supplier. And uh, 
I appreciate uh, the responsibility uh, that the technical director assumed uh, in that case. So we bought uh, that uh, software, it was uh, 2009, and in December the hardware uh, is uh, supplied and uh, we start installing it. In March, the technical director says whether we can switch on the cameras and the channel can uh, go on air. Just imagine, it had been three years, uh, we've been building the channel and uh, we've been doing software, hardware, papers, uh, all the things that we don't know. We don't have a format, we don't have content, uh, we have no show but we have an opportunity to go on air and so what I did at that time there were about 60 persons working there uh, at the time so there are already some business processes in place and on the 1st of April 2010 I gathered all my colleagues in the meeting room and I said let's turn on the cameras and let's uh, show uh, the audience how we are building uh, the TV channel, how we do interviews uh, for our reporters. Uh, so it's a reality show that we are going to show. And um, we contacted uh, cable uh, network operators and so uh, your Rain TV channel became a legend before the first show and uh, we had a contract uh, with uh, the cable ne network without uh, a format but they were ready to uh, connect us to their network and uh, another thing was that uh, we decided to broadcast through the internet why did we do it when I was uh, designing the channel in 2008 I asked uh, whether I should uh, uh, broadcast in the internet they said forget it you have just uh, a thousand more uh, persons uh, to watch uh, the broadcasts but uh, we decided to do some broadcast in the internet and uh, within two weeks uh, after uh, the startup uh, of going live I won't speak about the uh, reasons but we are disconnected from uh, the two cable networks and uh, we are in the internet only just imagine the situation we are already producing the content and we have the people but uh, we have no connection to the cable networks it was the day of radio and uh, I got all the radio managers together and five minutes before the show we had a call that we were disconnected from the networks and I understood that um, I could not tell about it to my colleagues. So I proceed with the, uh, that show and I was thinking again about uh, my dream and not giving up. And uh, it was a shock, it was horrible. We got the first advertisers uh, who go got contracts with us and uh, we have just internet with a thousand persons and so we uh, got together a technical meeting and uh, we were speaking about the internet and the signal in the internet that was a quite different thing and uh, that uh, there will be many people watching not a thousand but many more to some extent uh, that was an eye-opener for us so we became the first uh, internet channel and uh, I was thinking not about being uh, internet TV but a real TV channel yeah. but uh, I was explained that uh, the internet uh, is real cool it's uh, the headliner at the moment actually uh, Google was saying that that was our future and we were in the internet only for four months and we were studying that technology rapidly and we understood that uh, the internet is the future for communication uh, with uh, the audience because uh, people start to watch us not as uh, video on demand or delayed TV but as real-time TV because uh, 
You switch on a computer and uh, you have a response. We said that we are totally transparent and open uh, for our audience. We show how we are making our shows. And uh, the feedback that we got from the internet, we were the first uh, TV channel to make it to into uh, Facebook and uh, other social channels, social networks, and uh, we got lots of friends on Facebook, and uh, our audience were discussing uh, the content with us, uh, so we uh, broadcasted the first news program, and uh, uh, people got interested because there was no censorship, there was no control. We are not owned by the government, by oligarchs or anyone big in Russia. Uh, we had some author programs, we had uh, news uh, what uh, people wanted us to make and together with the audience in uh, 2010 we were about 50% uh, a news channel. So we were an information channel uh, which was not provided for by the budget nor the technology but we understood it was uh, our way to go and that's where we were going but uh, what makes us different from uh, another news channel it's a limited budget and uh, we have to save on everything so a uh, we optimized all technological processes uh, we uh, cut uh, the stuff uh, by uh, a factor of three compared to other news channels. We don't have a single uh, camera uh, to uh, be mobile, so we started to use phones, we started to use small uh, cameras. Everyone uses uh, this approach, Foxy, CNN and others, so there is uh, internet from any place but uh, we couldn't imagine it in Russia it's uh, but quality of the picture how can you show that but we weren't afraid of uh, a bad picture because we did everything live and we uh, showed everything so if something happens uh, we were not afraid but the uh, response uh, to the events going on provided a great uh, headway compared to other channels in Russia. We were faster than radio. During the uh, act of terrorism in Demodedovo, we were live on that event first, and uh, we were broadcasting about it for seven hours. Uh, this news hit the other channels in just two or three hours, and it was a major tragedy. And so we got the nickname of uh, the Russian CNN. It was hard to do that because we had no mobile technology, uh, dedicated TV mobile technology, uh, to film this event. Uh, we just needed Skype and a small computer as a replacement for this mainstream uh, technology. So we started to master uh, these technologies faster than anyone else, and now the other channels started to uh, use Skype uh, too. But uh, everybody laughed at us uh, because our TV did not uh, qualify by their standards, and so we broke all the stereotypes. We have an open studio with open windows, but any TV professional who comes in says, close the window, build, build the wall, because a TV channel can't work like that. But I didn't understand anything in TV, I was obsessed by this idea, and I said that everything will work here, and so everything is working. So. If you uh, get in our studio, you'll see that uh, something is going on, there, is, there are news on, there is a show being uh, uh, filmed here, and everything is working at the same time. So my ability uh, to break the stereotypes, uh, and uh, so we got 
real results. In 2011, we were we got one years old, and in this uh, uh, room uh, we had a modernization uh, council. And as we were a news and political channel, uh, we were uh, struggling for any guests, uh, various uh, authorities, and uh, we asked the president to come. So uh, we wrote him a letter that you'll speak about innovations at the modernization uh, council. So at that time, our channel was called uh, the channel of the opposition already at that time. So compared to what others, other channels uh, show, but uh, uh, recently I read that uh, in uh, a country where lies are ruling, any truth becomes opposition. So Medvedev agreed and uh, came to us. He, and uh, we are a small private channel with the audience of about a million people. He came, and uh, that helped us a lot, because all newsmakers of a lower level stopped to be afraid uh, to come to us and to create the content that we provided. Another year, what do we have currently? So it's 2012. We are lots of people, we are a great audience, so uh, we have lots of uh, uh, cable uh, operators and we cover 11.5 million of houses. We have full uh, completion of the content and we produce our own content. content. We don't buy anything except uh, festival movies and uh, documentaries. 60% uh, of all shows are live. We are very active in using social networks and uh, we preserved uh, meetings uh, in the uh, live mode when journalists discuss what they are going to show on the evening news. Uh, our audience uh, can s watch uh, these discussions. This is real interactivity and uh, this is what uh, we implement into our uh, uh, routine work. Now the audience affects a lot uh, what we choose uh, to show. And so we continue to make a great channel. We are not afraid of breaking stereotypes. If uh, we uh, start a project but no one likes it, then we close it down and uh, uh, start something else. We uh, broke uh, the whole uh, net, the program and the agenda of uh, a channel. So if uh, uh, a guest uh, is of interest to the viewers, uh, then uh, we keep him. Uh, notwithstanding, there is another show uh, to come on air in several minutes, so we are not afraid of these delays. And uh, we have become a multimedia content source rather than a TV channel. So we provide the channel and we show it in all ways possible. People uh, use gadgets, their iPhones and iPads to watch us uh, through the apps that uh, we distribute. Uh, we distribute the content through the uh, can uh, through the cable networks. We are quoted a lot. Uh, so we are among the top five of the most uh, cited channels. In TEFI, it's uh, the National uh, TV Award. Uh, we are 
nominated for three awards and it, this uh, award is uh, usually uh, for a television uh, which is not uh, cable so everyone was skeptical towards us but uh, now we are a serious player we hope that we'll make it it doesn't matter whether they uh, give these awards to us uh, but uh, we were nominated that was good and finally, when Medvedev, he's a kind of guide for us, before he left the position of the president, he gave uh, interviews to channels. There were four federal channels, the main ones, plus us. We were the fifth one who interviewed Medvedev. This is nonsense. This is the first time such thing happens. You couldn't believe that at the time. Because you are all, everybody tells us that uh, we are the mouthpiece of the opposition and now we are invited to speak to the president. But, uh, now we know that uh, Dost, uh, our channel, is watched, uh, is watched uh, by all governors and their teams in the regions because uh, we tell the truth. But we try to be balanced. We uh, are a place uh, for discussions. Uh, there is no other uh, channel like that in Moscow. And now we are turning into a successful business. A year ago there was a conference when uh, one of the CNN uh, co-founders came in, not uh, to the Turner, but also an elderly person. And uh, I was telling how we were making uh, the channel. He woke up during that uh, presentation and uh, he uh, spoke to me after the presentation and he told me that uh, uh, they used a similar approach. Uh, they were 200 persons and uh, the investment uh, was like that and now the CNN uh, capitalization is about 5 billion. So, you'll make it, he, he told us. And uh, for us, uh, the main objective now is, so far we have been successful, we do not have any criminal uh, news or any uh, news that hurts. We have uh, news that make optimistic and change the world around us. Now we have to turn it into business. And it's possible because advertisers uh, believe in us. And uh, we hope that CNN success is also attainable uh, for us. So now let's uh, show several uh, clips maybe so that uh, people will understand who you are. So this is just a demonstration of uh, uh, multimedia content. So what we uh, sell to uh, the advertisers. So when you have uh, advertising on uh, the Rain TV, you can have it in various media. What's wrong? Why isn't it working? It's it's a normal situation for a TV channel when something something is not working. What about the sound? So, you see, uh, the picture comes from one medium to another one, from laptop to an iPod to TV to a satellite phone. So, take uh, Dost with you. And this is a clip that we made a short time ago. Actually, uh, this is how we provide the information. This is the inauguration of the President of the Russian Federation and what was going on at the same time in Russia. People uh, were attacked by the riot police and detained. And these are pictures uh, of modern Russia, impossible to imagine at the time. This is from uh, uh, the court building, so all the, all the uh, things that we show make us uh, rather an emotional channel, unlike CNN. 
but we provide an objective picture. Because we, we, we have to, we're about to close up the conference. But I do hope you have some questions and we open the floor for the questions. Yeah. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Анастасия. Я хотела сказать, что мне безумно нравится ваш канал, и у вас очень интересный, например, мне очень нравится проповедь, и мне нравится, что вы поднимаете очень важные темы. Many uh, shows that you show, for example, you are against the homophobic uh, law that uh, is going to be enacted, and uh, you speak about things uh, that uh, nobody speaks uh, at other channels. As I understand now, you, there is no pressure on you from uh, the government. And what if uh, someone from the govern, government would uh, ask you to stop doing what you are doing? Are you ready to change the format or you are not ready for that? I don't say that there is no pressure. There is pressure. There were various situations. This is a private company owned by me. And it's not that easy. We speak about uh, some rough methods to close us up with the audience uh, and the influence in mind. Uh, it can uh, fortify uh, the current uh, uh, sympathy that uh, uh, the society has with us. So there are uh, compromises that uh, I'm ready to take, but. Uh, there is a limit that I can't cross, and for me it will be easier to close it up and uh, to sell. It's not just... I'm not trying to sell my soul. Uh, this channel is my soul and dream. Some more questions? Uh, what is the percentage uh, uh, proportion between a number of use internet users and the cable users? Uh, now there are more cable users already. Before, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, TV measurements are not representative uh, for ear TV, but internet it's very precise. Uh, you know, uh, now have a lot of cable uh, uh, proportion, but uh, the growth of internet uh, uh, also takes place. O also, there are some technical restrictions because sometimes uh, when we have uh, uh, some special ads, we have, uh, uh, for example, two million users and they uh, download video. Of course, it, it's understandable that it will slow down. But uh, further and further, it, it is improving. And uh, here we don't have any restrictions, I think, uh, for future growth. As I understand, uh, there are 1.5 uh, uh, million of u users uh, via cable, uh, uh, you know, per month uh, we have uh, 4.5 million uh, uh, viewers, uh, TV, TV viewers, and uh, without, uh, uh, besides internet, uh, yes, uh, we don't here include internet, and in internet maybe, uh, it depends, internet uh, per month uh, maybe uh, 1.5 million, uh, but uh, of course if there are no um, any special events, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a good European country. Uh, we have um, unique uh, viewers, uh, you know, uh, because uh, we d uh, they don't read us, they, they watch us. Uh, here, 100, 120. Um, I don't uh, hear the question, unfortunately. Uh, has your success created followers, or is it going to create followers in the private sector? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, you know, uh, I would like um, to have them. Of course, one of the mission is uh, to uh, have uh, respect for private business uh, and uh, entrepreneurship. You know, during the several years, uh, respect is lost. Uh, uh, youngsters, uh, officials, they work in raw years, in Gosprom, uh, uh, but, uh, but they don't do private business. And uh, we have a program we're doing. And I do a lot of uh, presentations. I meet students. I try to inspire them. Uh, and I try to say to them that they need to try. Uh, but of course, uh, are they, of course, you should be brave uh, to do this, to feed all this. Are there any other questions? 
Uh, please. Uh, about CNN, uh, uh, some initial investments uh, don't. Uh, why don't you? We are not a public company. Of course, it won't be a secret. But uh, now we don't say about this. You know. Uh, so this is quite an expensive uh, thing. Yes, yes, it's quite expensive now. A uh, house uh, in a French village, uh, you, you won't have, it seems. No, a uh, French village house, maybe somewhere in the future, uh, somewhere. Uh, a palace, maybe, I will build in France. Okay, are there any other questions? It's not a question, uh, but... Uh, uh, it's a comment. Um, I have a French origin. I want to say that when I uh, was watching uh, uh, elections, uh, uh, you know, on other TV channels, uh, it was horrible. And on your channel, it was very interesting because uh, people uh, spoke uh, uh, interestingly. And I think you have a very good mission uh, for people. Um, uh, to know how to speak about politics, not uh, politics as a choice, because uh, this is quite a one uh, piece of cake, but to do something uh, which is uh, quite uh, important. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that is all, uh, because everything was go coming up, coming, going, go going uh, from my heart. And we started to do this uh, from the heart. It was very close to us, not because we had the business plan, you know, uh, and everything was envisaged already in this business plan. I have, I'm Dmitry. Uh, uh, you now, uh, uh, you know, uh, have quite a, cl a classical way of um, uh, ad location, but then with time maybe it will change. There will be some uh, uh, revolutionary changes, I think. Uh, I mean, here, formats. Uh, what about ads? Um, you know, bicycles uh, are already invented, and ads are ads. Uh, but uh, we, thanks uh, to a good amount of direct air, we uh, uh, have a lot of uh, product placement when we don't do only videos uh, if it's good for us we integrate uh, this uh, in our space and uh, we can do this because we like it secondly now we use uh, this we try uh, to uh, see this multimedia uh, also um, uh, necessary for an advertiser of course we have classic in internet uh, TV banners uh, but now there are such projects we create which are integrated in all media including iPad for example here uh, we invent something uh, you know there is an idea and we have this idea on many platforms uh, it depends on um, the channel. But I, I think a uh, super bicycle cannot be invented. If you have ideas, please come to us. Thank you. Here there is a question about this. E, e, you know, is there is a feeling that it will be monetized? It can't be so. Or in, in any other case, it will die and my dream will not come true. Of course, it should be monetized as a format. And now it is like this. Uh, uh, mon monetization. What is it? Monetization. This is uh, people, viewers. And uh, we have a lot of uh, views. Uh, these views are, uh, are very important for advertisers. Uh, now we uh, take a classic money at money uh, from uh, big channels uh, now uh, the last question please because we don't have time who will take this uh, here and one of the more important people um, in the economy of Germany so I believe that he will comment on something so I just I just want your opinion on what do you think about TV the problem is I don't watch TV, <laughs> so uh, and, and I haven't covered uh, media. But what I would like to know is: is there globally is there any other channel that, for example, uses social media and, and kind of uh, view of feedback in the way you do? Есть еще какой-то в России канал? Is here in Russia or in the world? 
we did not study international experience, um, we did not see this. Uh, we uh, uh, currently we, uh, uh, some uh, project uh, in America, and it was built on social media uh, using um, this uh, social contact. But I've never seen this channel. Uh, but I was uh, told that this this, this that, that had a great success. In Russia, yes, uh, we have some ch such channels uh, which work in some uh, in informational uh, media, Commerçant TV, they use it, uh, but, uh, you know, actively it was never done, you know. Now uh, uh, maybe uh, it's uh, becoming uh, quite uh, intensive interaction with viewers. Thank you very much, Natalia, guests. Uh, thank you that you came. Uh, congratulations um, to you that you succeeded.